if one of these copies of data is uh, altered or corrupted, or in the case of ransomware, encrypted, uh, the system will simply recognize it as not like one of the others, and it'll basically ignore it and delete it and then spin up another replication to replace it. It'll just move on to the next valid piece of data. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Greisiger with Net Diligence, and we're continuing on with our webinar series. We do these for our partner education, cyber insurance partners, technology partners, the actual risk managers who may buy cyber insurance just to kind of learn what some of the experts are seeing as trends. Uh, today, I have the great fortune of speaking with Jeff Wollerman. He's the founder of TrueNote Tech. And what we're going to be talking about today, continuing on the theme of how can customers mitigate ransomware, is we're going to focus on uh, best practices around backup. And within the backup uh, world, we're, we're, what I was very interested in, Jeff, is your technology uh, that is essentially distributed uh, ledger technology uh, for backups. Um, I found that very interesting. Uh, I look forward to talking with you more about this. and. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about distributed ledger technology, uh, specifically in the realm of backups. Yep. And uh, I know ransomware is a huge concern these days for companies of all sizes, not just global enterprise, but um, small businesses, community banks. I mean, you name it, it seems like everyone is is getting hit in some way by some kind of ransomware so uh, it's one in three and within the cyber insurance world jeff i could tell you it's one in three claims are related to ransomware wow and why i was drawn to the backup topic is in talking to a lot of the incident response experts who assist clients every day with ransomware what they're saying is almost 50 percent of the time the threat actor got to the customer's backup systems so it left the customer with less choices as to what they should do. They would most likely have to pay the threat actor whatever their Bitcoin demand was because their, their backups that they depended upon were already, were already encrypted. So it wasn't a choice. So with that, let's just jump right into this. You know, just talk to me a little bit in, as a layperson. How does the distributed ledger technology keep a customer's data secure and immutable? Yeah, so primarily when you when you talked about the, uh, the the attackers getting a hold of backups, which is smart on their on their part, um, that's a big part of the way that we we take away the ransomware threat because there is no access to an entire system or an entire database, and that's because of the distributed ledger uh, approach to this technology. If, if you think about the term distributed ledger, it's it's almost kind of self-explanatory. The, the term ledger comes from accounting uh, in that it's a ledger book uh, that keeps track of the numbers. And so in the case of IT, it's not just numbers, but it's data. And when you're talking about distributed ledger, um, we're distributing many of these ledgers and it's that redundancy, uh, that replication um, that really takes away the value of any kind of attack and makes the data immutable and secure. Um, you know, by immutable, we mean like uh, unalterable, uh, that it's, it's always valid. Um, and so what distributed ledger technology does basically is it takes the original set of data and then it replicates it several times. In the case of our technology, Hyperion node or HN, uh, we replicated a minimum of three times, but there are additional replications spun up um, depending on how often the data is used, how big the client's network is. And so these different versions, these different copies of the data, they basically check against themselves to make sure that it's all true and accurate. Uh, so if one of these copies of data is uh, altered or corrupted, or in the case of ransomware, encrypted, uh, the system will simply recognize it as not like one of the others, 
and it'll basically ignore it and delete it and then spin up another replication to replace it. It'll just move on to the next valid piece of data. Uh, and all of these pieces are, are spread out, distributed in different locations. And it would be impossible for any attacker to locate every location of these pieces of data and encrypt all of them. Um, and, and there's no encrypting an entire data set because all of data is split up into these little 2.5 megabyte pieces or micro partitions. So right now with a lot of the cloud providers, on-premise servers, there's a single point of failure where once an attacker is in, they have access to an entire database, in some cases, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of personal private information, social security numbers, credit card numbers, you name it. And so we split all of that up. And so there's no access to an entire database like that. There's only access to one of these little pieces, which from an attacker's standpoint has little to no value. So you actually touched on ransomware. I mean, just, I guess if you could just summarize, how does the Hypernode, Hyperion node protect against the ransomware threat? Yeah, so two different ways. The, the first I just mentioned is that there's, there's no way for an attacker, if, if a client system is entirely on Hyperion node or even just their backups, there's no way for an attacker to access that entire database or that entire backup, uh, unless they are a valid authorized administrator and employee of the, of, the, of the company, and then they would obviously have access to it. Um, the only thing that they would be able to potentially track down and, and find is, is these little pieces. And the other thing that we do with those pieces is they're all hashed and encrypted themselves. And so, they all look the same. Um, so if an attacker were to find a server that was holding one of these backup pieces, uh, it would also include all kinds of little pieces from other companies or other users. And there would be no way to identify any of the data to know what kind of data it is, who it belongs to. And then they would still have to uh, either go about trying to break the encryption and getting into it, get access to see what kind of data it is, or encrypting it itself. But again, all they would be able to encrypt is a single little micro partition of data and not an entire system, as, as we've seen with, with many of the ransomware attacks. Um, yes. You know, Colonial Pipeline, it's like their entire system was seized. You know, ransomware is basically just seizing, capturing, and, and encrypting, uh, and then and then holding it ransom. And so, they could do that with one of these little pieces if they wanted to. Uh, but again, the system just ignores it and recognizes it as invalid and spins up another replication. And 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 uh, it it takes away the value incentive of attacking. Is, is, is the way I like to phrase. So, what about a company? Jeff, that has many internal endpoints for their data, does this make them harder to secure? I mean, it does in a lot of cases. Um, you know, right now, uh, the way a lot of the cloud providers are set up and, and the way just systems in general are set up, it, it's kind of up to the client to go out and secure endpoints individually and to make sure that certain people don't have access uh, but they have to actively go out and do this. Um, one of the interesting things about HN, Hyperion Node, our technology, is that it starts from the completely different premise, which is that all data is by default secure and inaccessible, except to the primary administrator who set up the account. And then it's up to that administrator or uh, sub-administrators under that administrator to determine who has access to data and for what reasons and for what amount of time. Um, and that can go down very specifically even to the column level on a table. So for instance, if some user is working with a table 
and they have user information that's like first name, last name. And some of those columns are social security numbers or credit cards. Uh, the system actually allows those columns to be encrypted and not visible for certain users that, that have not been given access to it. Um, so yeah, in, in the case of ransomware with multiple endpoints within a company, um, a company that is using HN for backups to protect against ransomware, every one of their employees with a computer within the company can also install HN. Even if they don't have access to the data or they don't even work with the data, they can just have HN installed on their computer and HN will immediately recognize it as part of that client's network and protect not just against ransomware, but breaches and, and any number of different types of attacks. So even if it's a, uh, an administrative assistant that, that doesn't even work with backend data, um, we, can, we can secure that, uh, that device, that computer. Uh, they can also do continuous backups of local machines uh, so it's constantly backing up. So if an attacker were to encrypt uh, a, a single computer at a company in the hopes that it would be valuable and they would get paid for it, um, by doing these continuous backups, they could basically just turn off the computer and wipe the system and then reload it with, with the last uh, backed up data for that, for that computer. Thanks. So this tees up really my final summary question. A lot of, of our customers that are insured for uh, cyber risk uh, might be SMEs, middle market, even larger ones, they outsource to service providers, third-party service providers. How can that entity protect against outside access to their data and, and maybe some other vulnerabilities? Yeah, no, that's a great question because a, a lot of companies work with a lot of different third-party service providers, whether it's uh, in a lot of cases, third-party cybersecurity uh, providers or applications, services. Uh, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about the ability to allow access for certain service providers, applications, uh, even outside developers that need to work with a company and they need to work with a certain data set or database, they can be given access uh, with very specific parameters, uh, say for a certain week of time from this date to this date, they only have access to this particular type of data. And like I said, that can go down as specifically as like the column or the row uh, within a table. Um, it can be made very specific so that even if you are giving a third party um, access to a table or a database that contains uh, personal private information, um, they can block out, you can encrypt certain rows or columns to make sure that that third party uh, has access and can work with the, the table, but they cannot see that personal private information uh, that's available in that table. So what we're really doing is we're putting users back in control and ownership of their data and being able to determine uh, permission, who has access to it, when and where, and for what reason and for how long. Very cool. Jeff, thank you so much for this summary. This has been uh, really educational for me. Um, backups being a huge safeguard that many of the cyber underwriters re require customers to have. Um, but I was especially, again, drawn to learning more about the distributed ledger technology and how that makes backups immutable. This has been great. Uh, greatly appreciate your time, and, and, and if people want to learn more, they can come to Everest Cub, uh, where we have some information on Jeff and his, his TrueNode technology company, or they could go to Jeff Direct at truenodetech.com. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Really appreciate you having me on. Happy to talk about it.